Richard, Good. is my thing visible? My, my deck? You look, you look great. I can see your presentation and we're live. So Zorian, to all of our folks joining us, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am really excited about today's masterclass about scaling pipeline. I think as every attendee knows, there's never enough pipeline and all problems in sales can be solved through more pipeline. But before we jump into our amazing content today, Zorian, we have a little bit of a tradition here on Modern Sales Pros for first time panelists. We, we love to get to know them just a little bit. And we ask just one softball question. So since the start of the pandemic, Zorian, are there any hobbies that you've picked up or skills that you've refined? Um, I've actually lost my skill set of learning how to stop work at the end of the day. <laughs> I've kind of gotten worse at driving because it's unnatural at this point. It's like, do you there's realize? Not, how not a, yeah. Well, when your commute is when your commute is like fifteen to twenty-five steps, it's much easier to uh, to work a little bit more, right? I'm better at walking, but I've gotten worse at driving. So I don't know if I picked up skills. I've kind of lost skills. But joking aside, I think the skill that I picked up is probably spending a little bit more time with my kids during lunch by going biking outside. And that's been really fun. Also playing uh, a little bit of uh, football or uh, soccer uh, right before lunch. And it's amazing. I've never really done that before because I always went to the office. Uh, that's good. It's, it's funny. It's funny the new things that can happen when you get a little bit of extra free time. For our folks that are just joining us here, we're going to launch a poll in a few seconds. That's going to give us a chance just to understand a little bit more about you. Um, and yes. as we're going through the presentation today, I'm going to mention this just a few times. Zorian has done this once or twice, three, four times. He's one of the best in the business at this. He scaled multiple companies from 20 to $200 million in revenue. And uh, he's, he's an amazing, knowledgeable member of the community. He's also working and he's a chief revenue officer at an amazing brand. So please do submit any questions that you have in the Q&A panel. Before we jump into today's content, Zorian, can you just advance us one slide, please? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. So uh, before we jump into it today, I wanted to thank you all for joining us. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, this event is uh, hosted by the team at Modern Sales Pros and sponsored by the awesome team at Infotelligent. For those of you who aren't aware, Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest community for revenue leaders. Those are folks that are in sales management, sales and revenue operations, and the related supporting disciplines. We have about 20,000 members and growing, and our goal and mission is to create an environment where our members can answer questions they'd otherwise struggle to solve on their own. We do that through bringing amazing speakers like Zorian to share their perspective with us, by having amazing panel discussions, and by creating an online environment where you can come and hash out all of the wonderful topics that are important to you. We've got about 6,000 different organizations that have membership in the community. So when you ask a hard question, you get perspective from kind of across the board here. For those of you who aren't members of the Modern Sales Pros community, you'll be invited to join afterwards and we'd really love to have you. But enough about Modern Sales Pros, I'm gonna hand it off to the man of the hour, Zorian, to, to take us away and introduce himself and then jump into a little bit more about how the heck do we scale pipeline to get to where we need to go. Richard, thank you so much. That was a great introduction. And uh, this is really a great community and I'm very, uh, very much proud to be part of. Um, so with that, with that, I just wanted to segue quickly into who we are, uh, but I do wanna let you know that this is not a, an overly self-promotional uh, webinar. Uh, there will be a tiny bit of uh, selfish self-promotion, but all good and all in good spirit and uh, basically made up for by a ton more uh, value add, which is in the culture of our company. So Infotelligent, uh, we're a B2B intent-based contact intelligence platform. Uh, we are, uh, you know, if you, if you are, are in sales or in marketing uh, and you need, you need accurate contact information for your accounts, for your ideal uh, customer profiles, target buyers, email, mobile phone numbers, firmographic, technographic, um, and all very much grounded in intent-based, uh, then this is us. And uh, if, you th if you're if you thinking like Zoom Info, you know, Discover Org, that's the space we're in. A little bit about myself, 
Richard, thank you again for introducing me. Uh, really quickly, I'm CRO here at InfoTelligent. Uh, Richard kind of told you the rest. Uh, you may know me from the community as the, the, the person who came up with the Champ uh, selling system. Uh, a lot of companies use Champ instead of Bent or others. Um, I also have a podcast here at InfoTelligent. We call it Top Insights from the Best in Sales, Marketing, and Go-to-Market. So uh, anybody who, uh, who wants to join us as a guest, make sure you ping me. Uh, and then with that, let's uh, move on to why we're having this discussion today. So Jeb Blount is one of my favorite authors, uh, very cerebral, uh, smart, intelligent uh, sales expert. And um, I really agree with a lot of what he says. One of the key things he says that I like to uh, quote is the brutal fact is that the number one reason for failure in sales is an empty pipeline. It, you can have a very high win rate and you can be extremely effective uh, at running sales cycles and uh, if you have an empty pipeline, you don't have anyone to sell to, and that's a problem. So with that, let's talk about today's agenda and how we're going to discuss scaling your pipeline. We're going to talk about the SES sales scaling formula. We'll talk about planning your outbound process. And uh, part of scaling your pipeline is account targeting. A lot of folks talk about it as account-based selling, uh, you know, targeting with spears, that's optimizing that process that's important. We're also going to talk about B2B intent technology that really helps scale your pipeline. And then lastly, we will talk about one more way to scale your pipeline. And if you're wondering what it is, you can notice what's missing. And that's a little bit of marketing lead gen that helps us in sales scale our pipelines and a couple of ideas from some of the best uh, minds in SaaS and sales regarding that. So with that, and Richard, I know we might have some questions here. I, I can see some, someone maybe uh, posting. If you could please uh, help me with that, if you don't mind. I, um, I sure will. As, as we get into this, folks, we're going to let Zorian get going here a little bit, but then we'll, we'll stop at different points in time to fire questions away. So do use the, uh, do use the Q&A panel for anything you have that you're interested to learn more about. And also, I don't mean to brag for Zorian, but he did say before he's been doing this for so long, it's, it's nearly impossible to stump him. So we want the really hard, <laughs> meaty ones. <laughs> no pressure, Zorian, no pressure. I, I meant that in the most genuine way, as in when, you, when, when Richard was asking, can, can people bring any questions? I said, bring the hardest ones. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yes. I mean, I probably can answer them, but, but I meant it in a, in, a, in a genuine, not boastful way, just to be clear, to be helpful, always be helping, ABH. So this, uh, the SAS, excuse me, the SAS sales scaling formula. So to build a sales machine, you must actually use a formulaic approach and a data-driven approach to drive your sales pipeline in order to have a repeatable, predictable, improvable, and scalable sales machine. You got to use math. Um, and some people argue about whether sales is an art or science. I'll say this. So yesterday I interviewed my friend, Jason Jordan. Uh, he, uh, he's the author of Cracking the Sales Management Code. Uh, he did a podcast with me. And uh, he, this is kind of the Bible of, of analytical quantitative sales management. And on page, I believe, like 14 there, it says, while it, it is easy to argue that selling is as much an art as a science, aspiring artists beware sales management is strictly a domain for those with penchant for science. And he said, with extremely rare exception, the best sales managers we've encountered are unconsciously competent scientists. So let's dive in a little bit of science here. Um, for anyone um, who wants to read those notes, um, please wait till the very end of the presentation. I'll let you know how to get a copy of this deck. Uh, and I mean, like, don't drop off in the last few minutes when I'll do a little bit of our self-promotion. Uh, but you'll know how to get a copy of this deck. So the formula is number of activities per day uh, times your hit rate, times your win rate, times the average deal size, or in SAS, you can say annual contract value, um, or you can do ARPA, average revenue per account, times 240, and that's your sales. And by the way, you can use that to also multiply by, uh, you know, by commissions, by team members, et cetera. But 
to make it simple, first of all, I'll start with 240. Why 240? If you take selling days in a year, subtract out all the bank holidays, all the federal holidays, your personal vacation, uh, you'll get roughly that number uh, to be somewhat safe. So furthermore, the hit rate is your, you know, for dialing, and we'll talk a lot, a lot more about this, for, for dialing out, for all the SDRs out there who are using, you know, platforms like Sales Loft or Outreach, it's your connect rate. Uh, which is how many target buyers you connect to and have actual viable conversations times your conversion of conversations to meetings. And then from there on to opportunities in your sales pipeline. And uh, for emails, for outbound emails, it's uh, your conversion responses to meetings, to opportunities, right? That's your hit rate. Um, and that's the rate at which you convert your, your lead, your cold, I wouldn't even really necessarily call it a lead in the now bound context, but, but a lead in the sense who you're, you're targeting into an opportunity. By the way, when I say outbound, I really want to make sure we're all on the same page. In my own taxonomy on outbound, I'm purely referring to direction. I've noticed a lot of companies for some reason uh, define outbound versus inbound and uh, conflate that with concepts of what kind of you know, for example, offer or asset uh, was downloaded. So I've heard from talking to a lot of different companies I advise that they call outbound when somebody downloaded a white paper, but they didn't register for a demo in a SaaS context. And uh, an outbound SDR will be calling them because that was not a demo driven by marketing. Therefore, they don't refer to it as inbound. I think that's actually completely incorrect. Um, because inbound and outbound are supposed to just define the direction. Uh, just like a train here in Boston, there's an outbound, outbound and an inbound uh, direction uh, literally written on the trains and on the uh, train stations. We call it a T here in Boston. Um, so long story short, outbound is truly when it's cold, right? Nobody who has come to your company before and it's not in your CRM uh, is someone who registered. And ultimately, the win rate is your opportunities um, that you win uh, all the way downstream to close one deal. And that's your sales scaling formula. Now, moving on, the levers here, this gets more interesting, is that if you do more activities, you increase the number of activities, simply mathematically, you're going to increase your, your result, your sales. It's a no-brainer. Um, so increase activities will mean that you're going to increase your, your pipeline. Then you'll, you know, with the same consistent win rate as um, in Latin, there's a phrase, cateris paribus, means keeping everything else equal. If you just increase the number of activities, you're gonna increase the number of sales, right? Nothing else, very simple. Um, and then of course your W2 as well, if you're in sales. Now, Jeb Blond coming back to him, he said earlier this year in April, when um, the difficult challenging time with COVID has kind of hit us um, and, and we were all struggling and figuring out how we were going to grow our businesses and revenue this year. He did pose this and said that activity is everything. That's the number one tip, right? And uh, activity will solve a lot of problems in the pipeline. In fact, Inside Squared, uh, where many years ago, I was on the executive leadership team, ran sales, uh, was kind of like CRO, ran sales and marketing. Um, they said that through a lot of benchmarking and research there recently, they said that sales activity is the most effective predictor of deal outcomes, which is a fact. So activity uh, drives performance, drives your pipeline, which in turn ultimately drives results. But you'll certainly hear a lot of debates on um, the concept of hitting the more button, right? Uh, people will say it's not really about just hitting the more button. And I do agree with that. There's no question that if you increase the number of activity activities infinitely, it's going to hurt your sales. And the point here is that quantity is not mutually exclusive from quality, right? Let's use common sense. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not we're saying that you should have no quality, but just keep increasing the quantity. And one of the keys to quality, besides obviously your messaging and preparation is your hit rate. So when you have a better connect rate, 
um, and you have ultimately uh, better, uh, you connect to more target buyers, you're going to increase the number of opportunities in your pipeline. It's a no-brainer. Again, using that phrase from Latin, ceteris paribus, if you keep everything else equal, but you increase your hit rate and the quality and ultimately get to a better connect uh, and then convert to meetings and opportunities through better messaging um, and all the other key steps you take in a sales conversation and delivery and positioning and all the things that you should do as part of your job in a prospecting team, you're going to get more out of it. You're going to get more ops and more sales. Well, how do you increase the connect rate? There are a number of things that will come into play there, but one of the key things that, that we help with at Infotelligent is providing you with high quality, accurate contact information and account information. So imagine that if you give all of your SDRs correct email address, correct mobile phone numbers, right? Uh, and especially mobile phone numbers because you cannot reach a lot of people at the office today because a lot of folks are working remotely. As we talked about earlier uh, with Richard that, you know, a lot of times I work from home nowadays uh, during COVID and uh, we're not at the office. So an office phone number on the website of your, of your account is not as helpful. So if every one of your reps has correct email address and correct uh, mobile phone number, they're going to have a far higher connect rate. So if you go from 3% connect rate, which is pretty pervasive and traditional, uh, you can measure that, right? For example, in, in sales loft or outreach, and you triple that to 9% and you can definitely get 9% or more, that's a three times increase ultimately in everything downstream. Simple math in this formula. So no brainer. But when using this SaaS sales formula to plan how to scale your sales, use simple capacity planning principles, uh, time allocation and, and common sense, of course, to understand the limits of, of that quantity in increasing your activities um, so that, that it's balanced really well with quality. Now, moving on to planning your outbound process. So Dwight Eisenhower, a former president and also the, um, he, he was titled Supreme Commander of Allied Forces during World War II and the D-Day invasion of uh, Northern France and Normandy. Um, and, you know, which was a pivotal moment uh, during World War II, for any history buffs out there, I love history. Um, he said that in preparing for any battle, uh, he has found that actual plans are useless, right? But planning itself and the thoughtful process of ruminating and thinking through all the moving pieces and how they affect each other, uh, that is indispensable. That is critical. And the plans are useless because there's another quote uh, that could have been Colin Powell that, you know, no plan uh, survives the, the first contact with the enemy, right? But but having thought through what else might happen, uh, not just the one plan that you have in place, but all the other sort of intricate details that are interconnected, if you will, that's what's indispensable. And in sales, it means knowing you're expected, you know, all the inputs and all the outcomes, that's the KPIs that are critical to your preparation. For example, very simple, um, very simple prospecting production model. You know, it takes, you know, 30, 45 minutes to drop it into an Excel spreadsheet and play around with the numbers. Nothing, nothing difficult here. Um, the first part here tells you the, the process for email production. And the second piece down below over here is dials uh, or calls. So on emails, it's very simple. The conversions are, you know, sending emails and those conversions to responses and from there on to meetings and then from there on to demos, kind of downstream conversions. When I say responses, of course, I mean, as I point out here, positive response, not um, <laughs> a lot of people just take all the emails that have responded and divide it by the number of emails you sent. The problem is it includes a lot of responses like, hey, take me off your list. So don't <laughs> count that in. We're only looking for those that drive the meetings and ultimately the con conversions to demos in SaaS or sales meetings and um, you know demos, opportunities, et cetera. Um, the, the bottom part is your dials, calls, and those that get you to conversations or connect, and then ultimately to the sales meeting slash demo, uh, and ultimately to an opportunity. So you want to understand those rates inside out. Now, here's the problem. <clears throat> Believe it or not, uh, benchmarks for this are nearly non-existent. 
yes, if you even Google it, you're going to get, um, you know, you're going to Google things like uh, response rate from emails and you're going to get blog posts like this one from a pretty well-known company in, in sales marketing tech um, that I respect quite a lot. But there's someone who posted this and they said that they increased their, um, their uh, response rate from 1% to 14%, right? That's a 14x increase. Uh, they said that they increased their email prospecting response rate by 1,400%. Um, actually, I think in math, that would be more like 13, um, 1,300. It's 14x minus one, you know, math, whatever. Irrespective of, of the pedantic sort of calculation there, long story short, um, doing a 14x jump from 1% response to 14% response is like pretty unheard of. But let's do a sanity check in Excel because if that person really has that, that means they can send 100 cold outbound emails. And I mean cold. I've never heard of cold emails producing 14% response. So that means you send 100 emails to people who don't know you at all, cold, outbound, and 14 of them respond to you. So if you plug that into such a spreadsheet, over here tells you you're going to get you know, on a hundred emails that you can send every day, which is fairly easy to do because you can use an automation system like Outreach or Sales Loft. No, no brainer. Um, but let's just play with easy numbers. We can do 50, whatever it is that you send or your team send. But if you send a hundred, you get 14 responses. That's incredible. And that person obviously implied positive responses, but whatever it is, 14 responses. That means when you multiply it by, let's say 20, 21 or 22 selling days, depending on the month. Um, so the month of September and October, those had 22 selling days. That's over 300 meetings scheduled, right? Because you have 14 responses. Let's assume all of them agreed to a meeting or otherwise, why did they respond? Even if you want to say, let's say out of those 14, um, you know, Four people were responding with take me off your list. Well, you have 10 people responding that they want a meeting. Let's say they all ultimately get scheduled to a meeting tomorrow or next week. And you have 20 selling days. That's 200 meetings completely from cold outbound. Has anyone here heard of that before or ever seen that in their company from one sales rep on the outbound side? If you have, please pose that in the questions. Give me your name and number. I'll call you right after this because I'd like to know what exactly they did. Uh, short I, I of offering, know. I want to know too. <laughs> That's, that everybody's would be gonna unprecedented. want to know. Unprecedented. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're offering a thousand dollar Amazon gift card, I've never heard of that. Long story short, these types of benchmarks that are posted online are they're just incorrect and misleading, and that just doesn't happen. So use your kind of uh, logic on that. So moving on, is there Zorian, any can I pause you? Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, go ahead. Wrap up your point. I want to pause you before we move to the next session. I've got a few questions for you. I'm just saying here, you need something like that to really understand and, and do the yeah. planning like Eisenhower said. Planning is everything. So, so when you're thinking about this, I know we're going to get into sort of thinking about how to target accounts. Do you recommend organizations go through this math monthly, quarterly? Is this part of the annual planning process? Like how, do, how would you recommend orgs do this? Definitely part of the annual sales planning, no question about it. Um, you can obviously do it, you know, every quarter to to tighten the numbers based on your uh, sales team, how many uh, folks you have um, in the uh, in the pro on the prospecting team, etc. But yeah, generally, at the very least, you got to do this annually. Uh, I think, and I, listen, I, makes... I, I want to say this: the sales leader is completely responsible for this and for figuring out the right process and the right targets. Uh, for this, it's not the sales ops team. The sales ops teams can help with the numbers and the spreadsheets and pressure testing them. But the sales leader needs to understand this deeply and inside out because you're the sales leader. You are fully responsible for your team's success. You're brought in to make decisions and figure out how to get from point A to point B, for example, from 20 million to 100 million in the next three years uh, or five years, whatever it is you need to really have that completely figured out, right? 
Yeah, no, totally. And I think just one other, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm kind of wrapping my head around this completely. If you're building out sales plays to achieve certain outcomes, you'd probably expect impacts on these numbers, right? We're going to run this sales play in this vertical. We expect a higher response rate because we're giving a thousand dollar Amazon gift card or whatever it might be. <laughs> I don't recommend giving that that much, but <laughs> I, I can't imagine anything yeah. else is going to get you a 14% response. Yeah. <laughs> so, so moving on to account targeting. Uh, David Ogilvy, who said that don't count the people that you reach, reach the people that you that count. And reaching people that count is all about targeting your accounts, uh, account-based selling, account-based targeting, account-based sales development. Uh, but first, you need to build your target account list. And that list, you got to have firmographic things like industry, company size, annual revenue location. Um, that information needs to be accurate. And by the way, uh, this is where we uh, play in Photelligent. We help you identify the right accounts. You can do it by revenue, by number of employees, their location. Um, we help you get the right contact information, accurate data, uh, and also insights about each account from intent signals to all kinds of other things that we provide you to make your account targeting far more effective. The problem today is that a lot of sales teams, they spend less than pretty much a third of their time selling. Nearly two thirds on average of the reps time, right? Almost 65% is spent on non-revenue generating activities. This comes from another company, InsideSales.com. Uh, they rebranded, but it was published in the Forbes magazine. So they did this research. Two thirds of the time is spent on non-revenue generating activities. They're basically doing a lot of things like researching the right email address for the account, researching what accounts to target, researching how to contact this account because they don't have the mobile phone number. That's where we help. And uh, you've all heard about the concept of spears, obviously seeds, nets, spears. Spears are all about targeting specific accounts, larger accounts, the ones that you really have to uh, go after and go deep at. And this is the part where I kind of tell you very briefly about how we help, but in the context of, of, of sharing information. So you're going to want to do advanced search for the types of accounts. You're going to want to enrich the data, make sure that the contact information you have is correct. By the way, for your sales team, if you already know the few hundred or thousand customers that you have, like the ones you want to target, you can find lookalike companies that you can also sell to that are just like your best customers. We offer you that as well. ABM, ABS, ABSD. So account-based marketing, account-based selling, account-based sales development. You can get all the right contact information within each specific account you're targeting, intent data and technographics. You get all the information, that's our product, on those accounts, contact information, the revenue, firmographics, technographics, everything. You know, staples here, here's, you know, a, uh, an example screen showing you, you know, the types of accounts, uh, products, everything, you know, we show you news, lookalikes, email patterns, uh, and also emails that we give you as well. Uh, this is not an election map. Um, <laughs> it is just a map of the locations of the account. Um, I know everyone is staring at election maps uh, today. So accurate contact information is key to your success. It is key to drive that hit rate in the sales scaling formula that I showed earlier, mm -hmm. which can significantly increase, increase the number of meetings and opportunities in the pipeline. There was research in the sales benchmark index about the importance of high quality <clears throat> and accurate data for your accounts. And they said that organizations suffering from poor data quality are experiencing operational inefficiencies, excessive costs and customer satisfaction issues, which are costing them dearly. So and I have to put a fine point on that too, for folks that have attended, we did a, a webinar actually on just data hygiene and it's, there's this notion of the 110, 100 rule. So it's, it costs you, it costs you a dollar to, to make sure you've got the right information about the lead as soon as you capture it. It costs you $10 to update it once you've had that first conversation. And then after that, it's a hundred dollars per lead or contact to update that if it's been in your CRM for two years with bad information. And that doesn't take into account some of what Zorian has shared with us about like, 
wasting time maybe building a cadence that includes a bunch of people with bad email addresses. So I wanted to put that point on there because I think it's important when we think about the data hygiene and the data quality. I like that. <clears throat> One ten, 100, I agree. The, the bottom line is having accurate account targeting information like this increases the average revenue generating time of your team and just mathematically downstream your pipeline. Now let's talk about intent data. It's a hot topic today. And uh, with intent data in place, you can basically think of it like this. There is this kind of legacy approach. Our marketing did a good job here. The legacy approach, um, as, as beautiful as it looks, um, <laughs> of a, of a, of a you know, historical approach, uh, it's very old and outdated. We, we and, may have people on the call that don't even know what a rotary phone is, Zorian, just to date us. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's this beautiful piece of historic equipment. But tick, tick, the tick, new tick, approach tick, tick, is like an iPhone right? It's like a modern uh, smartphone. And uh, the point is this, that a legacy approach to targeting your buyers is you create a target account list, you write a script, and then you reach out to everyone, just email them. And it's called spray and pray, right? With intent, it's a little bit different. And basically imagine you have this uh, magical uh, lamp that if you rob, this is from Aladdin, uh, I want a list of companies that are in the market for a product or solution that we offer. And the reason there's this kind of like screen representing and, and, uh, and illuminating the magical component is because intent technologies is very interesting. What it does is, is sort of uh, something you would probably even question and say that cannot even be possible, but it works pretty magically. And it helps you identify the best fit companies interested in what you sell now and those who are most likely to buy from you. How is that even possible? Well, I urge you all to go to our partner, Bombora, and we're actually a multi-channel, multi-source intent provider. I think we're the only ones in the market in the contact in intelligence space for sales and marketing that has multi-source on intent. But our, one of our key partners is Bombora. We, have, uh, we really love working with Bombora. And uh, they've created these partnerships. And they have a technology and get millions of data points every month from all the different websites they've partnered up with where people are searching for information. And they know different topics that people search for. And when you go in there and you type your topic, whatever it is, it's very probable you'll find a lot of companies that have an increase in search for that topic that week. And they actually rank it for you, I'll show you. Long story short, knowing this B2B intent data is critical today because you can go prioritize accounts based on them having intent and you can do better sales prospecting by prioritizing companies that are showing intent this week with the right messaging at the right time, right? It's pretty incredible. So for example, on the screen, we call it intent qualified accounts and IQAs, right? And uh, yes, it's kind of like MQLs, but in the modern sort of intent world. And uh, you're looking at buyer signals and here in our product, you can see intent score, score like 77 or 92. And this is an example of someone searching for a specific topic category that may or may not obviously relate to what anyone is uh, doing here on the, you know, as a, as a, attendee for our webinar listener. But long story short, you can actually do that for what you're selling into, for what your product category and solution category is, and find potential prospects that are qualified with intent this week. And you can reach out to them. 80% of sales are going to the first company they come in contact with, right? So a, a company out there who doesn't know about you, but is searching for topic category and the category that you sell, right? The product you sell. And if you reach out to them first, right? Before your competition, you're more, most likely to get that sale. So that's- uh, Dorian, yeah. A few, yeah, a few questions on intent. And this is, this is actually a great question. Um, intent data, it feels, uh, it feels too good to be true. I think yeah. that uh, what, what, you're, it is. What, you're, it, what you're starting to see. So the question is around uh, like the California Consumer Privacy Act, 
the general data privacy regulation coming out of Europe, uh, the general increase in privacy consciousness in humanity today. You look at the changes in iOS 14. How does intent-based data work outside of, let's call it the United States, right? Let's just take GDPR as an example. Does this stuff work in Europe as well? So this is a great question, really smart question. So the interesting thing about intent and why it does work is that it actually does not have anything to do with a specific person, right? It doesn't capture any personal information. It only captures corporate information, which is, you know, if you think about GDPR and all, all these privacy laws, they don't really, um, they don't relate to corporate information. So knowing that a company like, uh, you know, CDI Corporation here with 92% uh, intent score here, right? It's not showing you the person's name. It's not saying that uh, someone named Richard at that company was doing a search. And our product allows you to click on that account and find the right people by the right title that you sell into based on this intent. And it's highly possible at that point doing correct account-based selling and account-based targeting that you will ultimately reach the right person within that account mm -hmm. who is indeed searching for this, but it's done completely ethically and legally. Yeah, I think that's an important part just to restate what Zorian said. The intent data is done on what, you know, in we would consider at the account level. So there are signals that are coming from Dell or uh, Citigroup. And then yeah. you're going to blend that with data that you get either in your own CRM or from, from an Infotelligent to develop the right strategy. Hey, cool. Uh, it seems like everybody's on our, there's a lot of activity on our website from the product marketing team at whatever company. And oh yeah, Bombora is telling me they're in the market for my solution. Probably, probably a good a good chance to uh, reach out and touch that person. Yes, thank you. Yep, that's exactly how you want to sell right now when you're prospecting, because your competition, uh, knowing intent, could be reaching out to all the folks that are in the market right now, and you're just doing cold, uh, what we call jokingly spray and pray, as I pointed to the <laughs> legacy approach, right? But but. Yeah. Sort of joking aside, it really is an amazing technology. Um, it's certainly not a, a silver bullet, if you will. You certainly have to do the work still. You have to identify the right uh, contacts and target buyers within the accounts. But knowing which accounts are in the market for something you sell is pretty much have the battle, right? So now moving on to one more way to scale your, your pipeline. And... Uh, can anybody guess? Well, okay. You can probably guess because I did mention that during the, uh, the agenda conversation. The number one fastest way to scale that we haven't really talked about, and I'll tell you why it's number one. So for everyone who has read From Impossible to Inevitable, um, by the way, there's a chapter there, I have to say, on metrics that I've uh, contributed to. Uh, my name is not there, but I'm very proud to say it. Um, you know, my claim to fame, if you will. But uh, anyway, so long story short, if you read this book, there's an actual uh, verbatim quote that the number one way and the number one lever that drives revenue growth and can create hyper growth is lead generation. And this is marketing. And I believe that Jason Lamkin and, and Aaron Ross, uh, they talk about it as the number one way because marketing can send a lot more emails in one campaign and one email send and can do a lot more than almost your entire SDR team uh, that entire day or that entire week sometimes, right? And then when you do it again and again and in a way that's customized and, and somewhat personalized and has context um, and when you have activities like the, uh, the Nets, that Aaron Ross talks about in his predictable revenue book. Um, and if you do smart marketing, uh, inbound marketing, smart lead generation, that's certainly obvious why it's referred to as the number one lever that drives your revenue growth. Uh, and certainly very predictable one. Aaron, Aaron Ross and, and Jason Lamkin talk about this um, as the following. They say that 
you've been trying to grow your leads and thus sales, but it's been harder than you expected, maybe a lot harder. Uh, and predictable lead generation is the lever to creating hyper growth. And they also say that without predictable ways to fill your pipeline, you're going to struggle. So we talked a lot about um, SDR teams. We talk a lot about uh, doing account-based targeting. And this is that next level where you're complementing all your sales prospecting with marketing prospecting, I guess you can call it marketing prospecting or lead generation. Uh, and you get now a full um, kind of full complement of sales and marketing generating your pipeline. And imagine sorry, that you're marketing. Yeah, please. Oh, sorry, I wanted to. I wanted to pop in. I've, I've got a few questions on that, and there's a few questions let's that are do coming it. in live. You've yeah, you've been part it. of the run a few times, right? You've you scaled a few organizations from what I think a lot of folks would think is decent to like very big. Um, that's an exciting run. How does the role of marketing change as you go from? Because we're talking about lead gen here, and there's like infinity things that lead gen could be. How does yeah. the role of marketing change as that organization scales from 20 million to 50 to 100 to 200 and so on? That's actually a really great question. Um, and the reason it's great is because there's a real powerful, um, powerful insight here. So I was at a couple of companies where we went from 20 to 100 million in three years, uh, which was incredible. I've, I've kind of taken it for granted when we grew so fast back then, but, but I realized that ultimately uh, while you're having so much fun, you don't realize how hard it is to do this. And then when you look back, you realize what were the patterns that, that produce such right. hyper growth. And to your question on marketing, the, the, the bigger you are, as you grow from 20 uh, to 50 to, you know, it could be like a stepping stone, like 75 and then a hundred or, 20, 50, 100, um, marketing becomes more and more impactful as, a, as a, an input into your model and also as a producer of qualified leads, like mm -hmm. we'll call it MQLs, that ultimately help drive your sales meetings or demos uh, that help therefore drive your opportunities in the pipeline and then downstream to, to sales. And the better marketing you have, and specifically, I mean, lead generation, um, the better off you are and the more probable it is that you're going to achieve that hyper growth and hundred million. Very consistently, I'll say this, that the customer acquisition costs in your, in your SaaS metrics, unit economics, uh, in other words, the cost of sales and profitability uh, offset and balance becomes better and better uh, the stronger your marketing is because mm. as, as proud as we all are in terms of developing successful SDR sales prospecting teams, the fact is that throwing bodies at the, at the growth equation is, is a very high cost of sales and high customer acquisition cost in the end. Um, you need it. And there are uh, reasons to use SDR teams strategically. And uh, you can obviously target more specifically, right, with spears versus nets. Because when you throw out a net, which is a kind of a marketing uh, concept, you know, according to Aaron Ross, when you do lead generation, you know, you can get, you know, whatever uh, type of fish you're fishing for, but you're also <laughs> going to get some, some crabs and seashells that will be part of that. Uh, but with spears, when you're targeting uh, with your sales development team, you give specific accounts and you're just targeting those. So there is a lot of value in that. And you can also, with SDRs, you can target larger accounts, right? Enterprise targeting. Uh, so you're pointing them into that direction very specifically. And there's a ton of value in that. But if you're just trying to grow as a result of your sales development team, um, you know, at a level of 20 million to 50 million to 100 million, that's extremely expensive and you may actually stumble and not be able to do it unless you have really, really effective lead generation marketing. And when I say lead generation, I don't mean like, I mean, real lead generation, not just like somebody um, pinging you and, and, and giving you cold names from LinkedIn with their email address. That's not lead generation. That's just, <laughs> uh, 
I, I call that, you know, cold names like that, they're just called either names or I call them suspects. Um, some people call them prospects and I'm like, no, that's not a prospect. No, 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 no. Prospect it's, it's, is that's someone further up. <laughs> yeah, prospect is someone you're selling to uh, when you have an opportunity in your pipeline and your CRM, Salesforce or HubSpot, you have an opportunity and the person who's your, your champion there, that's your prospect. Um, but, but that's my definition. A person who's just a name you've never talked to and you have their email address uh, because somebody made a list in Excel from LinkedIn, that's a suspect. That's a cold name. When I say lead generation, I mean high quality marketing, high quality marketing activities. And basically a lot of times those successful companies uh, that, that, you know, that go to a hundred million marketing generates, when you look at sort of the analysis of revenue or new business bookings, let's say, generated by marketing uh, or even opportunities in the pipeline sourced by marketing or even higher upstream, uh, any meetings that were initially generated by marketing and then qualified by the inbound SDR team. Marketing should drive ideally about two thirds of that or even 80 or 90 percent of that for you to get to 80 or 100 million in, in global sales. That's what I've seen consistently several mm-hmm. times. So long, long answer to your question, but hopefully, yeah. you know, with some profound insights, very important. No. You know. I, I, well, cause I think that's, that's one of the things too, right? you you can read and you always hear about the, you hire the wrong VP of sales for the size of organization you are. And there's been a lot written about that. Like a, like a whole lot. Like we've all got stories of the Oracle guy or gal joining the seed stage company and shocker, it doesn't work out when they roll out medic. Um, but the, the part that's maybe spoken about a little bit less is marketing's role and all of that. And Zorian, I want to double click into what you had just said around that you reach this point where marketing's got a big contribution, right? That could be, it's sourcing these suspects, turning them into prospects and handing them off to you. It's influencing deals and all that. Is that different based on your average contract value? Right. If, if you're selling, uh, uh maybe a mid market motion versus a, a bigger, you know, baby enterprise to enterprise motion, does that marketing contribution change? Have you seen it? Or is it, that's a pretty good benchmark for folks like 80% by the time you're there. That's a great question. I think for large enterprise deals, of course, by the way, let me pause. Um, when someone says enterprise deals, I always uh, wonder what do they really mean? Right. Because <laughs> let me just be honest here. Uh, I mean, I've, after business school, I went to sell at IBM just to learn how to you know, how to do sales. I'm one of those MBAs who really wanted to, 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 to learn how to be a sales leader. So I, I went to, to sell at IBM and, uh, you know, at IBM, when you say enterprise deals, we're talking about not a hundred or 300,000 or, or $500,000 deal. That's not an enterprise sale that you can close over the phone. I mean, um, I've helped my, uh, sales rep earlier this year, close, uh, an $847,000 two-year contract over the phone. When people say enterprise deals, the first thing I think about is a couple of million dollars. Um, you know, I, I know uh, Jamal Reimer, for example, some of you may know him. He was top 1% at Oracle. And, uh, you know, he had a quota every year of about $50 million. Uh, he closed, you know, a couple of $50 million deals, one single deal. Uh, which is both product and services of $50 million. That's an enterprise deal. So when people come to me and say, hey, you know, um, and they want to talk about enterprise deals, I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, $500,000, that's not an enterprise deal. But then again, it's just my kind of personal perception. (laughs) So... (laughs) <laughs> with that, with that big caveat, uh, with that big <laughs> caveat <laughs> out there. <laughs> so if we're talking about real enterprise deals, multi-million dollar deals, for sure, um, you know, it's much more about a, an enterprise sales professional uh, who drives those. And uh, in that case, it's not lead gen for marketing. But when you're talking about anything up to like a few hundred thousand dollars, marketing can continue contributing to that very well uh, with with high quality lead generation um, and the typical you know motions that marketing does for the company. 
Uh, I think that's I think that's great, great, great perspective here. And Zorian, and we got there's a, a few more questions coming in, and I want to I want to get to those as well. Um, one of the questions that we have, and this is a good live question, it came in a little bit earlier. As you're looking at kind of the macro view of the business, and you're looking at pipeline and maybe that formula across multiple different segments or verticals or products or channels, there, how do you figure out from that information where to invest? and sort of double down on something that's working versus maybe entering new markets? So let, let me paraphrase the question yeah. to make sure I, I get it. So basically, looking at different channels, um, you want to understand where to, to double down and invest, right? Yeah, or, or make a decision to invest maybe in a completely new market. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's a strategic that's a strategic decision. Um, you know, certainly something that a CRO uh, works on uh, with with the executive team. Um, I mean, it depends on, on a number of factors. That's kind of part of your strategic planning. Uh, the executive offsite we do, you know, for at bigger companies for like a full week somewhere, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, it's smaller companies. When I say small, you know, even like at a hundred million dollar company, you probably do a few days of an offsite in late August or September to start planning for the next year. And you're going to think about where you're going to have your best success in terms of, you know, your products, your markets, you know, verticals, channels, etc. There's many different things you look at and that's your foundation. And, and you want to double down on that. And there are many ways to double down on that. Uh, probably outside of the scope of this of this webcast. Um, and then in terms of entering new markets, I mean, that's typical go to market research and strategy. And it's like, you know, is your product um, a good product for that market? Is your uh, positioning strong for that market? Do you have the experience expertise that you need for that market? There are many different things uh, that go into that. But yeah, I mean, there, there's a whole strategic planning component to that. Is that, is that what the question was? Yeah, I think, I think that answer is a, a key part of it. And just to kind of double tap on a couple of things that Zorian mentioned there, it, it is as much a strategy discussion as it is a discussion around like, hey, where are we being successful? The other thing I'd say is um, be really understand what's working and what's not about your motion. I've seen folks make that mistake before where they go, oh, this is working really well. And they're still in more of a founder led motion because the founder knows or the port or they're part of the port codes. So they think they can go sell to these brands when in actuality they can't. And looking for commonalities and adjacent use cases that are similar. In my past life, I'd sold to uh, streaming media companies, quick service restaurants, and a few others. There's industries that are adjacent to those that have very similar use cases that represented a new market for our brand and our product that we wouldn't have considered. But when we stepped back and looked at how these folks were using what we had, it was like, oh, that would make sense. This is similar for us. And it was low in back to Zorian's point. We didn't have to retrain the sales team on how to pitch the product. It was very similar versus going and saying, we're going to open up an office in Asia or in uh, the Middle East or something like that. So just a couple of thoughts there, but that is a really long strategic discussion to have. Um, and the answer to Zorian's point is really, it depends on like a whole, whole, whole lot of factors. Yeah. And look, I mean, I don't know, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in, in really early stage and, you know, founder led sales. <laughs> um, I have some familiarity of course, but that's not my domain expertise. And I think that um, if, if there are some, you know, listeners that are indeed early stage uh, and not at like, you know, 10, 20 million in sales. Yeah, I mean, I think you can run a couple of very light experiments, um, you know, even using like data from our product, for example, or, or anywhere else, you can grab a list of uh, companies and marketings that, you know, and mar or markets that are adjacent to what you're doing uh, and then um, do some prospecting into them and then just collect the data and analyze it. I mean, it's, it's just kind of like a, a, a subset of a scientific method for sales, if you will. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's many ways to do it without going overboard. Um, and and Richard, I think I, you had a, another question oh, or? 
Uh, no, I was just going to add add to that, Zori, and you, you jogged a memory here too. If folks aren't following Mark Roberge, um, former CRO at HubSpot and uh, managing director at Stage Two Capital, he writes a lot about this sort of how do you how do you approach a new market? How do you think about it? How do you build a compensation plan for somebody that you have approaching a new market? How do you what's the profile of that person? I'd encourage you all to check out either uh, his writing or he's worked with us in the past, and we've done some stuff together that dives like really, really deep into this. And keep in mind, this is the guy who HubSpot's, I think, pretty well known in Zorian, you know, Boston boy. It's a it's a really, really impressive sales motion that they've built. Uh, and Mark's written a lot, but he's got a lot on that specific area. Mark, Mark is great. Many, many years ago, he was my advisor, uh, like a CRO type advisor for, for a few years. And I was very fortunate because um, at Inside Squared, the company, you know, he was a he got shares in the company and uh, I got to spend like, you know, two or three hours a month with him every month um, and learn a ton from him uh, and his sort of insights that he acquired through growing HopSpot to hundred million. And also he had his own advisors like John McMahon, who was one of the most well-known CROs at like PTC Blade Logic. He's now on, um, on the board of Snowflake, uh, John McMahon. So I'm a huge fan of Mark. Um, yeah, his, his insights are great. And it's I'm, real good. Uh, if you like, if you like this content, he's a good person that has additional kind of this real, real, real data-driven approach to sales. Um, Zorian, yep. we have four minutes left and I feel like we could talk for another six hours. So let's roll through the last slides and then we can get to the questions here. Yeah. So really quickly, this is the, the section about us, uh, our product. And I've already, you know, explained a lot about what we do. Of course, we do look alike, um, multi-source intent, um, insights, you know, firmographics, technographics, that's what we do. That's what we are. If you want to get, um, some free, uh, contacts of our, out of our product, you can, uh, get this tool on our website, infotelligent.com. It's on the right. Um, if you go and get a demo, this is a way for you to request a copy of this presentation. So, uh, with all the links and everything else, and also if you have any questions, if you get a demo, uh, I'll make time to speak to you myself. I'll even see if I can hop on a demo. My sales team can tell me you came from this event. If not, I'll follow up and we'll schedule a 10, 15 minute call later. And I'll be happy to share ideas from here or anything else. And with that said, if there are any other questions, please let us know or email it to sales at infotelligent.com. Uh, the team will bring it to me. Uh, but I'm also happy to take the next two minutes and, and answer any other questions. Yeah. Whew, sorry, and that was that was awesome. Um, I'm going to fire one question because I think that's probably all we have time for here. Are there yeah. specific lead gen activities you've seen be maybe more successful or less successful, or specific methods you've seen be more successful or less successful since the start of the pandemic? Oh, interesting. Since the start of the pandemic, um, yeah, I think I think my take on it, and I'm not a marketing um, expert by any means. Uh, but, but I've ran, you know, uh, teams as a CRO that are, uh, lead gen and marketing teams under my, in, in my organization. So I've seen it, I've seen it many times work really well and, and what works and whatnot, but especially after the, you know, the COVID, uh, situation and crisis, what I think is, is, is key is flight to quality. And, um, uh, and I think the kind of marketing that's actually offering real high quality, whether it's. Uh, educational, you know, white paper or blog posts that are truly high quality, uh, not just something that is sort of like a copy of many other um, points you, you read somewhere. Um, even even uh, people on LinkedIn who post who post insights that are valuable uh, and unique. I think there's a <laughs> lot of interest in that. No. Oh. I, I love I love that point the flight the flight to quality here and in Zorian I'm I'm sorry to say we're at time um, I, I I gotta tell you this was this was awesome I feel like I, we could chat about this type of stuff for hours um, just Thank a couple you. points on Zorian folks as as he mentioned um, you can reach out you can get to connect with him he is actually also very active in the modern sales pros community which is great so you'll see him chime in on answers and he really is somebody who when he says always be helpful. Like this is a man who's done it a bunch. He's, he's willing to share that knowledge. So if you do have questions, feel free to um, feel free to reach out. 
Uh, on on behalf of the entire community, Zorian, I know you're incredibly, incredibly busy. I want to thank you for sharing this hour here today. And on behalf of Gina, behind the scenes, all of our attendees and the 20,000 folks that are watching this in the future on our YouTube channel, thank you so, so much, Zorian. And I look forward to doing this again. And I want to thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, take care, Zorian. Stay safe, everybody. Talk soon.